On this Sunday night, the Prime Minister steps in to resolve a provincial standoff and reinforces who's in charge. After an emergency meeting, Justin Trudeau declares the Trans Mountain Pipeline will be built and Ottawa will help foot the bill. We'll take you through what's at stake financially, environmentally and, of course, politically. Also tonight, a standoff south of the border. It is Trump versus Comey, this time in prime time. This is The National. After weeks of protests and trade threats over the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the premiers of Alberta and B.C. came together in Ottawa today. And while they didn't reach a consensus, the prime minister made clear his government will do what it takes to push the project forward. The government of Canada's objective has been clear. To develop the vital infrastructure that is critical to our ability to get Canadian resources to global markets. So here's what's at issue. Kinder Morgan wants to expand the existing 60-year-old Trans Mountain Pipeline that runs from outside Edmonton to Burnaby, B.C. It's a $7 billion project that would nearly triple the capacity of the current pipeline and give Alberta's oil sands more access to Asian markets. But that also means an increase in tanker traffic on the West Coast, and that's what has the B.C. government and environmentalists concerned. The premiers emerged from their two-hour meeting with neither side backing down from this escalating feud. As David Cochran explains, the line from the federal government, enough is enough. The prime minister interrupted an international diplomatic trip to deal with a domestic political feud, throwing the might and the money of the federal government behind Alberta to get a pipeline built to the B.C. coast. The Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is a vital strategic interest to Canada. It will be built. Ottawa will start formal talks with Kinder Morgan to put taxpayers' money behind the pipeline. The details and the dollars it will take to calm investors won't be known until the negotiations are over. We will not have these discussions in public, but construction will go ahead. The details may not be firm, but Alberta's premier, who is also putting money on the table, says this is the concrete action she wanted from Trudeau. I am quite confident that the nature of the uh, conversation that we are having at this point will uh, get the job done. Between the three of us, we continue to disagree on the question of moving diluted bitumen from Alberta to uh, the port of Vancouver. Nothing in the meeting moved John Horgan's line in the oil sand. He's not dropping his lawsuits or his objections to the pipeline, which he calls a giant environmental risk. My uh, obligation is to the people of BC, and I'm going to defend that uh, until I'm no longer the premier. So Trudeau is also promising legislation, new laws that will assert federal authority over the pipeline and limit BC's ability to delay it. That's on top of what will be big taxpayer cash, and he blames John Horgan for the bill. I don't think we would be in this current situation if uh, the British Columbia government hadn't um, continued to uh, emphasize its opposition to the project. But along with that verbal stick came a financial carrot, a willingness to work with B.C. to boost the $1.5 billion coastal protection plan to further guard against possible spills. A diplomatic offer on a day of flexing federal muscle. We are one country with a federal government uh, that is there to ensure that that national interest is upheld. Trudeau clearly has the stomach for this fight. He will soon find out if Kinder Morgan does too. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, this is not the first time a Canadian government has stepped in to save a project or an industry. In 2009, the then Conservative federal government and Ontario invested $13.7 billion in GM and Chrysler as part of a broader North American auto bailout. But that happened during a global economic meltdown. More recently, the Liberal government offered Bombardier $372 million in interest-free loans while the company was struggling. The government of Quebec invested $1 billion in 2015. And it's not the first time Ottawa has invested to keep an energy project afloat. Hibernia means dignity. <laughs> dignity for all Newfoundlanders. In the 90s, Brian Mulroney's government took a stake in the Hibernia oil project when it was close to collapse. 
there's a lot of money at stake here too, but for each of the leaders at today's emergency meeting, there is a potential political cost as well. Justin Trudeau has promised to balance the environment and the economy. That will be put to the test here. Not to mention the Liberals have 18 seats in B.C. and they want to hold on to those. Alberta's Rachel Notley has no choice but to aggressively defend the pipeline. Thousands of oil sands jobs depend on it. And come the next election, the NDP will be in a tough fight with the newly united Conservative Party, already accusing Notley of not standing up for the interests of her province. And in B.C., John Horgan's minority government is only able to stay in power with the help of the Green Party, which is vehemently opposed to the pipeline. So while Horgan has made his position clear, not everyone in B.C. opposes the pipeline. Tonight, Briar Stewart has reaction from both sides of this divisive issue. Not far from where the new Trans Mountain pipeline would end. It was built out of one cedar tree. Stands what Indigenous groups yeah. are calling a watch house. I think it's only fitting we put it here. It's part of a long-standing protest against a project the Prime Minister is committed to. It's totally unacceptable for him to want to push this through, you know, from Alberta coming through our traditional territories to this body of water that we're protecting. Uh, it's unacceptable to, uh, to carry on. No, Kinder Morgan! Will the political maneuvering continues, those here say so will the protests. Well, some First Nations are strongly opposed to this pipeline and are challenging it in court. Dozens of others have signed lucrative agreements with Kinder Morgan and are frustrated that they could lose out on millions if the project doesn't go ahead. The Whispering Pines Clinton Indian Band was the first to sign an agreement with Kinder Morgan and the chief says they're losing out on jobs and tax revenue, which should already be coming their way. Had they started this in 2014, we would be covering the, the pipe back up, but you know, we're still six months from shovels in the ground. And so those are the kinds of things that, that my community finds annoying. While groups remain divided over the pipeline, there's another layer that complicates this project, the issue of just who should have say over what. It sounded like Premier Horgan had been called into the principal's office. Jocelyn Stacy is a law so professor at UBC. She says Morgan even if the federal state. government tries to reaffirm its jurisdiction through new legislation, that too could end up being challenged in court. There's no question that the federal government has constitutional authority over the pipeline. Where there's uncertainty is over the effects of the pipeline on the environment. And the environment is shared jurisdiction. Which is why the politics around the pipeline remain so complicated and why even after all this time, there are still no guarantees about its future. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. So a pretty busy Sunday in Ottawa. Let's turn now to the U.S. and another political and very public war of words, Adrian. Well, that it is. For more than an hour today, Rosie, Donald Trump tapped away furiously on Twitter his target, James Comey. The FBI director Trump fired last year is telling his story in an upcoming memoir and an hour-long interview tonight. As Paul Hunter tells us, for someone as publicity-conscious as Trump, this means war. The book is already a bestseller, not yet in stores. It's number one on Amazon. How and the TV so interview, interview about the book promoted about like a Hollywood justice. blockbuster. Should Donald Trump be impeached? Stephanopoulos, Comey, this Sunday night. Certain to be watching Donald Trump, who before sunrise today tweeted six times on this, calling Comey a slimeball who's not smart, has told many lies, now with a book that's badly reviewed. Slippery James Comey, he wrote, will go down as the worst FBI director in history by far. Fired by Trump last May, partly over, as Trump later put it, the Russia thing. Comey had been investigating whether the Trump campaign had colluded with Russia to meddle in the 2016 election. Now, Comey dishes on Trump as unethical and untethered to the truth and compares him to a mob boss. And recounting the time, he had to tell Trump of unconfirmed allegations that Russia had compromising video of him taken while he was in Moscow for the 2013 Miss Universe pageant. How weird was that briefing? Really weird. It was almost an out-of-body experience for me. I was floating above myself, looking down, saying, you're sitting here briefing the incoming president of the United States about prostitutes in Moscow. 
Comey also talks of Hillary Clinton and of his decision just before the election to make public that the FBI had reopened its investigation into her emails. It later turned up no evidence of any crime, and Clinton has suggested Comey's decision cost her the election. What was he thinking at the time? She's going to be elected president, and if I hide this from the American people, she'll be illegitimate the moment she's elected. Said Trump today, that's evidence Comey made self-serving decisions based on politics. So, is he a showboating, disgruntled former employee or a truth-telling patriot? Tweeted James Comey today, he hopes readers find the book useful. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. While Trump is on the attack when it comes to James Comey, he is continuing to defend and indeed celebrate Friday's coalition airstrikes on Syria. Syria, Iran and Russia have called the strikes aggression and invasion. Trump has called them an enormous success. This weekend, more details emerged about the targets. Three sites were hit, according to the Pentagon, and from the before and after pictures, apparently they were hit hard. Two alleged chemical weapons storage sites near the city of Homs and the Barzay Research and Development Center in Damascus, which has long been linked to Syria's chemical weapons program. Its three buildings were leveled to the foundations. The attack has left many people wondering, will this change anything at all? Derek Stoffel looks at that from Jerusalem. The information war is now underway following the missile strikes. Take this building, destroyed, the U.S. military says, because Syria's government was developing chemical and biological weapons here. Not so, says this Syrian official, who says they were only producing pharmaceuticals, such as cancer drugs. The message from Syria's president that for the regime, it's business as usual. Meeting with visiting Russian politicians, Bashar al-Assad called the missile strikes an act of aggression. The Russian lawmakers say Assad was in a good mood, while in Washington Donald Trump was in a fighting mood, defending his tweet declaring mission accomplished. For many, it brought back memories of George W. Bush and that banner that turned out to be premature during the Iraq war. Even a former Bush press secretary, Ari Fleischer, cautioned against using those two words. Trump tweeted today, lashing out at the fake news media for demeaning the success of the military action. But there are questions about what exactly the strikes accomplished. In the larger scheme of things, this is not very important for the Syrian civil war. Nikki Haley, US. On Fox News, Trump's ambassador to the UN was asked if only hitting the Syrian regime for using chemical weapons will give Assad the green light to keep killing with conventional weapons. I don't think we've ever said it's okay, period. I think that we have a lot of issues in the world, and I think we're trying to put out as many fires as we can. Trump's policy on Syria appears to be one of disengagement. We look forward to the day when we can bring our warriors home. On Friday, he repeated his call to bring the 2,000 American soldiers in Syria fighting ISIS back home. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. Now, as Derek mentioned just now, with the carnage of conventional weapons unchecked, there's no sign the horrors of this war are going to stop. But will these strikes even achieve the limited goal of stopping Assad from using chemical weapons? That, too is far from clear. I think the words cripple and degrade are, are, are good, accurate words. With words, the Pentagon is as precise as it likes to think it is with smart bombs. That will significantly impact... Words like significantly impact or we believe. And we believe that's gonna, they've lost a lot of equipment. They've lost a lot of material. The message is carefully calibrated for a reason. Actually ending chemical attacks in Syria is devilishly difficult. Almost a year ago, after the first round of airstrikes, the idea was deterrence. If this happens again, we are putting you on notice. It did happen again. Even though diplomacy, not airstrikes, had thinned out most of Assad's chemical stockpiles years earlier. Back in 2014, the international community supervised the destruction of facilities, delivery systems, and hundreds of tons of chemicals. But chlorine gas reappeared on the battlefield within months. And chlorine is a real arms control problem. It's 
deadly, it's easy to deploy, and it's available commercially because it happens to be a vital part of water treatment. In water, it saves lives. In bombs, it takes them. So how does anyone stop its use? And there are still nerve agents like sarin that can be made in easy-to-hide facilities. So think the airstrikes a few days ago got them all? I think we dealt them a severe blow. There's some left, but we dealt them a severe blow. The Pentagon seems to know better than to claim they got it all. Whatever effect these strikes have, it is Syrians themselves who will have to deal with the consequences. So we checked in with some Syrians we've introduced you to on this program over the last month or so to get their view, a doctor, a writer, and a teenager. We wanted to know what they think of the recent airstrikes. Here they are in their own words. بس الحقيقه انا ما كنت مسروره اليوم يعني بهذا الوقت من هي الضربه يعني ما كنت سعيده ابدا فيها هي الضربات جاءت متاخره جدا نحن من حوالي اسبوعين بس تهجرنا من الغوطه بعد استهداف الغوطه طبعا الغوطه مستهدفه من سنوات ولكن حمله شرسه ضد الغوطه كانت حوالي شهر ونص تقريبا استخدموا فيها كل انواع الاسلحه اخر شيء كانت الضربه الكيميائيه اللي عم يقولوا انه كرمالا استهدفوا النظام لما فيني ازعل لما المقار والاشخاص نفسهم اللي عم يقتلوا الشعب السوري من سبع سنين ما فيني ازعل اليوم لما عم يستهدفون All the people here was thinking that this airstrike will finish the regime, will stop the, this regime of making massacres after massacre. So they now feel disappointed, especially after the speech, after the airstrikes from uh, the Pentagon that they have finished. And if the regime use uh, the chemical weapons again, we will do something in that time to wait the a criminal to to make another crime to punish him. I think it's um, it's not fair for the people who, who are living here. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. Humboldt says goodbye to two more Broncos today as the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League carries on. An unconsidered effect from the largest wildfire in California's history. Kim Brunhuber shows us what all the ash is doing to the ocean in this week's Dispatch. And it's spring in Canada, but let me tell you, in much of Ontario, you wouldn't even know it. It's burning a little bit on my, my skin, but, but only sometimes, only you know? Sometimes. I hate it. I just want spring to come. I don't know. It's freezing. I can't take it. I'm going back to my apartment. The cradle of Canadian aviation looks pretty much as it did in 1909, when the Silver Dart flew over Badek Bay, the first heavier-than-air flight in the British Empire. The small group who made it happen included the inventive Alexander Graham Bell and a daring pilot named J.A.D. McCurdy. I made this little flight, about uh, 60 feet high, three quarters of a mile across the bay. As McCurdy flew, Alexander Graham Bell watched. To them he said, oh my boy, this may have made history. An exact replica of the silver dart 95 years later. It's incredible. I can, I Jane Shapley, McCurdy's niece and a pilot herself, says her uncle knew he was part of something <laughs> special. Remember, he was a protege of Alexander Graham Bell, so he, I'm sure he picked up the big, understood the big picture from the very beginning and uh, understood that this was a breakthrough. That first flight was the liftoff for Canada's own aviation industry an expansive, undeveloped country needed air travel. 
And so began the era of the Bush pilots, who opened up Canada's north. The Second World War accelerated aviation technology. Canada developed a fledgling airline industry. And by the 1950s, this country was on the cutting edge with such aircraft as the CF-100. We had a huge pool of engineering talent in this country and a truly can-do attitude. The Canada of the 1950s in the aeronautical world didn't take a back seat to anybody at all. In the history of aviation in Canada, there is one development, one achievement that falls in the category of what might have been the Avro Aero. Canada was on the verge of being a global power in fighter aircraft, but the Aero was expensive, and it was scrapped by Prime Minister Diefenbaker in 1959. You realize how ineffective it would have been. Still, Canada's aviation industry has never looked back. Bombardier is a global giant in regional aircraft. CAE is number one in flight simulators. Canada's first astronaut, Mark Garneau, is the first non-American flight engineer on a space shuttle. And the Canada arm is an orbiting billboard for Canada's aerospace technology. Today, a multi-billion dollar industry that owes a small debt to a few dreamers in Badek, Nova Scotia, nearly a century ago. Eric Sorensen, CBC News, Ottawa. There she goes! After a two hour wait, the rains finally subsided and the replica flyer trundled down its runway, tantalizingly close to taking off before splashing into a mud puddle. Bleak, dreary, miserable, those are just some of the more positive words being used to describe the spring ice storm in southern Ontario and Quebec. People are using some other words too, but we'd get fired if we said them here. The area in the storm's path is huge. Well over a thousand car accidents have been reported in Ontario alone, as well as flood warnings. Power outages are affecting tens of thousands of people in a region home to millions. Perhaps the most painful part of all this is that winter officially ended almost a month ago. Our Natalie Collada takes a look at how people are coping. Usually four weeks after spring is declared, people put away the shovels, parkas and scrapers. And a lot of people now wishing they hadn't. I don't know. Big spring. Horrible. <laughs> kind of like, uh, yeah, bait and switch. It sucks. <laughs> Like, I think this weekend should be canceled. We deserve a mulligan. I just want spring to come. This weekend, Environment Canada issued freezing rain warnings across southern Ontario and parts of Quebec, canceling flights, forcing some to sleep at the airport, sending cars off the road. The, the driver steers. Ontario Provincial Police posted this video to Twitter. Too aggressively for the conditions. Then they go for the break. Warning drivers just how tricky the conditions can be. Canadians have, of course, seen worse. In some places, it snowed in August. Then there was the 1998 ice storm, where at one point, downed trees and lines knocked out power to 1.5 million people. Fast forward to 2013. Thousands in Ontario, Quebec and Atlantic Canada were without power, in some cases water too, for nearly a week after the big ice storm. Learning from past events is critical this time around, says Toronto's mayor. To make sure that whatever may come our way in the next uh, 24 hours that uh, we're ready uh, to deal with it. This time the big concern is what happens when all the snow turns to rain. Flooding is the main worry. In some places, it's already started. We're not only looking at the freezing rain, we're also working with our partners around the flooding when we go into late Sunday, early Monday. Still, this is spring in Canada, and the weather, well, let's just say some people are rolling with it. I think it's exciting, actually. When you get a snowstorm in the middle of April, and uh, you know, it feels like, you know, it feels like almost like uh, November, Christmas all over again. Not exactly like Christmas again, and many are hoping it's just over soon. This is April in Canada. The end. <laughs>
still, April seems uh, late for all of this, Natalie. She joins us uh, from outside of Toronto. What can we expect when the weather ends and the temperatures actually go back, uh, go back up? Well, the big concern, of course, when those temperatures go back up, Rosie, is, of course, the flooding. If you take a look beside me here, you can see the Humber River. This is just sort of in the west end of Toronto. It's already moving fast. On the way here, roads already flooded. The concern for the city of Toronto and a lot of other areas that receive both this freezing rain and then, of course, these warmer temperatures is what's going to happen when that those warmer temperatures rise and all that water it has to go somewhere so the big concern there is the flooding of course so that is what people will have to be watching for th uh, throughout tonight and also tomorrow as they try to head in back into work whether it's walking bicycling driving or however you choose to get to where you need to go tomorrow rosie thank you for staying wet for us tonight natalie appreciate it <laughs> of course it's not miserable everywhere in fact in other parts of the country it is a gorgeous spring Take a look at this photo that Ian, of course, took in Queen Elizabeth Park in Vancouver earlier today, and he says it is still really nice there. The air is fresh, life is good. And Rosie, I can feel your thoughts through the cameras, so my friend, have at it. You know what, Hannah Man Singh? I just <laughs> can't even. At least he has to come back. He has to come back to you and deal with this just like the rest of us. <laughs> exactly. So there. <laughs> Listen, still ahead on The National, if your piano repertoire consists of chopsticks, then get ready to be dazzled by a 13-year-old named Alma. Joining us now from her chambers at the British Columbia Supreme Court in Vancouver is Madam Justice Beverly McLaughlin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You are very young to be appointed to the Supreme Court. I guess that's an occasion for a double congratulations. <laughs> you, you probably be sitting on the bench for a long time at that level. What is it that you'd like to be remembered for at the end of it all, if you can look that far ahead now? Well, uh, I suppose I'd like to be remembered as uh, uh, being um, uh, a good judge, a judge who understood the problems uh, that were put before uh, her who uh, dealt with them in a, a clear and uh, a hopefully uh, correct manner and uh, a judge who uh, also showed an understanding of the sort of problems ordinary people face and, and uh, well, let me interrupt you there because I, is it true that the Supreme Court hears cases usually that have to do with ordinary people? My impression as an ordinary person is that the Supreme Court deals with things that are very legal, technical, arcane even. Well, uh, the concepts may seem legal and technical and arcane, but I think the sorts of things the Supreme Court deals with are very much uh, uh, of great importance to ordinary uh, people uh, look at some of the recent decisions on abortion signs in uh, um, stores in Quebec, uh, language rights, uh, charter rights. I think a lot of these things impact very strongly on ordinary people, and uh, very often the, the suits themselves are brought by ordinary people, but they have a, a, an impact that reaches far beyond the particular litigants in a particular case. So I, I do think that the, the court is very much concerned with uh, the rights and liberties of, of ordinary people. Let me ask you if there's something on the agenda pending, a social issue, a legal problem that's likely to come before the Supreme Court that you hope does, something that you're dying to tackle at that level. <laughs> well, I don't know if judges usually think in terms of issues they're d dying to tackle or of agendas that they set out. Very much what we do and what we decide is determined by the issues the litigants bring before us. We're just there to uh, decide the legal questions that are brought before us. So we can't determine our own agenda. But it is obvious, having said that, that uh, charter issues remain important. While uh, there has been a great deal of work done by the Supreme Court to date in defining rights and freedoms under the charter, uh, there doubtless will be other issues which will come forward in the next few years. And uh, those are very important.
mourners dressed in their jerseys today on their way to the funeral for Humboldt Broncos captain Logan Schatz. One of two ceremonies held today for players from the bus tragedy in Saskatchewan. No cameras were allowed in, but even outside, emotions were raw, as Olivia Stefanovic found out. The streets of Allen, Saskatchewan emptied this morning as hundreds of people poured into the small town arena to say goodbye to 20-year-old Logan Schatz. This is uh, probably one of the largest events that will ever be held in Allen. Schatz was the captain of the Humboldt Broncos, known as the guy who always showed up to the rink with the biggest smile on his face. He was outstanding. Like, I, There's not a bad word you can say about that guy. Schatz also played floor hockey. Those teammates donned their jerseys and shared memories of their friend, whom they called Shotzi. I'd be looking down the bench, where's, where's Shotzi? I need to ask him what his opinion is. That was my first instinct every time. So where's Shotzi? I need to ask him. He'd always have the answer for me. In another province, another player is remembered. The hometown of Parker Tobin laid out hockey nets to commemorate the goalie. The 18-year-old was initially believed to have survived the crash until the Saskatchewan coroner's office admitted it had misidentified him. I just can't imagine as a father myself to, to go through that uh, range of emotions. Um, but uh, the, the, the community is here to support the Tobins in any way possible. There's support for survivors too. This weekend, a surprise appearance of the Stanley Cup. And last night was the first Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League game since the bus crash. On the same ice the Broncos were headed to. One of the teams stopped at the crash site before the game. Once you stop here, it hits harder than anything else. You see where these guys were, how close they were to playing their game. The cause of the collision is still under investigation. As people wait, they brace for another week of funerals. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Allen, Saskatchewan. Tomorrow, friends and family of another crash victim say their goodbyes to 18-year-old Humboldt Broncos forward Evan Tovins, who was killed at the scene. A memorial service for Evan will be held at Saskatoon's Saskatel Centre. It gets underway at noon local time. Our Susan Ormiston met with Evan's dad a few days after the crash to talk about the life his son lived and how he's being remembered. Here again is some of that conversation. So tell me about what's on this table. It's an interesting collection. <laughs> his first goal from his SJHL career. Scott Thomas wants people to know his son, Evan, 18 years old, in his first season with the Broncos. His sense of humor, his humility, his passion for life that he had. Evan was smart. He loved KD, baseball and hockey. His name tag from his dressing room, uh, the stick that was left behind, mustn't have been his gamer, probably his practice stick. That was left behind, we got from the dressing room. Last Friday night, he was on the Broncos team bus. Scott was in a car 45 minutes behind. We pulled up to the accident site. By the time we got there, the fire trucks and the police were there and the bubbles and the flashing blue lights. So we get out and Paul LaBelle was right behind me. And of course, we go running up and they stop us and can't go any further. And you could see it was bad. He was with another parent, Paul LaBelle. Police officer met us there and said, uh, sorry fellas, we can't let you go any further. There's been casualties. And we're like, well, yeah, but our sons are there. We gotta go, we, our sons are on that bus. And he's like, no, sorry, can't let you go. Uh, Paul was like, well, what the hell? What happened here? Like, how does this happen? It's a beautiful sunny day. The roads are clear, there's no snow. And the police officer said, well, Semi-driver blew right through the stop sign. He said he couldn't see it because the sun was in his eyes. And Paul looks over his shoulder and I look over my shoulder and this is just my opinion, but the sun wasn't in his eyes. Scott could see the front of the bus obliterated, the roof ripped off, and he knew from years of hockey that rookies always sat towards the front. So when we pulled up and I saw the front of the bus was gone, I think my head knew right there. My heart didn't. Of course you hope and you hope and you go and you sit in the church and you hope and 
most of the families are there and all the veterans' parents start getting phone calls, we got your boy, come to the hospital. You get a little deeper and at the end of the night it's mostly the rookie's parents there. And, and then, of course, the police had the conversations with us. The parents were warned. There were so many injuries, they might not recognize their sons. But Scott could. Uh, he had a very distinctive birthmark, just a little one on his right cheek. And I remember clear as day uh, in the bathroom back there. He would have just after he started school. And he comes running in up to the mirror and takes his finger and he's trying to wipe his birthmark off. And I'm like, buddy, what's up with that? He's like, well, dad, the kids are kind of bugging me about it. And I said, well, that's you. That makes you who you are. And he never, ever brought it up again. But I never thought I'd be using that birthmark to identify his body. I'm a chiropractor, and uh, so I know a little bit about the human body, and so I'm feeling as much as I can with my hands, and I felt his head, and we could see that there was some head trauma. I knew right there that he had skull fractures. As he looked at his son, he was reassured that he did not suffer out there that night. Kissed him, kept telling him that I loved him, and that's probably all I said to him then. The Thomas House has been overrun with friends and flowers. Yesterday, Braden Camrud, one of the injured players, was able to fill Scott in on the last moment in that bus. Braden remembers just changing songs on his phone or something and looking up, debating whether he should get his suit on. And he just happened to put an eye on Evan, who had just put his tie on and ran his fingers through his hair. And Braden said everything went black after that. How do you rationalize what happened? I've stopped trying. There is no rationality to what happened. What do you think that Evan would want you to do now? and your family. Just knowing him, he'd be like, really, Dad? <laughs> what are you making such a big production out of this for? You know, like, this is way too much of a production. Just get on with it already. Get on with your life. I'm almost guaranteed that's what he would say. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Saskatoon. As it should be, there has been a huge outpouring of support for Humboldt this week, but we want to show you one tribute that just caught our eye, this one from Truro, Nova Scotia. Here is Jim McCready and his special musical tribute, and in his own words, why he just had to do it. It's impossible to express in words, so I chose to convey my condolences with music in the arena where they would have spent most of their lives. Thoughts and prayers from a hockey fan from the East Coast. I don't know whether 
in California was largest, the largest in the state's history, burning an area larger than New York, Washington, and San Francisco combined. Plumes of smoke could be seen from space. On the ground, the wildfire destroyed more than a thousand structures. But what about the impact at sea? The Pacific Ocean, just off the coast of Southern California, is home to one of the world's most diverse marine ecosystems. Kim Brunhaber investigates in this week's Dispatch from Santa Barbara. This is why the Santa Barbara Channel is considered one of the most vibrant ocean ecosystems in the world. I've never seen um, humpback whales that close before in my life. But they're not the sea creatures marine biologist Kelsey Bisson is hunting for. To see her quarry, you need a microscope. And this is her harpoon. She's helping researchers aboard the Shearwater launch a mechanism called a CTD at several locations up to 40 kilometers off the coast. So this way we can sample the ocean at any depth of interest. Um, and it also has a ton of sensors on it. So when it goes to depth, it's telling us information in real time about what's, um, what's in the water. Bisson's mission, to find out how the microscopic plants, animals, and marine bacteria have been affected by this. The worst wildfire in California's recorded history. Last December, the Thomas Fire devastated several coastal communities around Santa Barbara. Walking through the ruins of several incinerated neighborhoods, I saw firsthand how the fire destroyed the lives of people, plants and animals on land. But I never considered how these clouds of ash might affect creatures along the ecologically sensitive coast. In California, wildfire is an inexorable stage in nature's cycle, and scientists say the ash that ends up in the ocean often provides nutrients for marine organisms. But this fire didn't just burn grass and wood. It consumed cars, homes, metals, plastics. All sorts of chemicals were incinerated into an ash rain that fell into the ocean. When these things are put into the air, knowing how they're going to react with um, seawater is a, was a bit of big question marks. 
It's something no one had ever studied until now. During the Thomas fire, she happened to be doing some research floating in that sea of ash and soot. So then and there, she decided to shift gears and study the effects of the fire. All right, we're recording. Surface. Surface. Three months later, she's back now at a key time during a heavy storm that is once again linking the charred land and the sea. When there's big, big rains like the ones that we're having right now, it's basically flushing all of the valleys that at this point now um, have a ton of ash in them before being cut out. So this is again another time where potentially there's a ash deposition event that's putting a lot of material from land into the ocean. From the depths, they retrieve a carousel of ocean samples. Researchers collect the water and filter the samples in this makeshift lab, which Bisson will study later on land. We'll be able to do different analyses like DNA extraction and things like that to say what exactly is in the water, at what depth and at what time, and what does that indicate about the ecosystem. On her first trip, there was lots of ash in the water, as expected, but she never imagined she'd find it at all depths. And we were able to see microscopic shards of ash in water samples that were both in the surface ocean and also ones that were at 400 meters deep. And there was another surprise. She found a huge bloom of toxic algae that can kill fish and marine mammals. We think that maybe that their presence in the water was spurred by the fire, and that's a running hypothesis right now that we're testing. The fact that she found ash near the bottom of the ocean suggests it could have a lasting effect on the food chain. The toxicity has a residence time and it lingers and it stays and that can then be carried from a very small microscopic level up to a level that we could see like in fish or something like that. 200 meters. This phenomenon isn't just a California problem. Bisson has family in Quebec. She says what they're learning here could help coastal communities in Canada. There, too, as development in areas right next to wilderness has increased, so has the number and size of megafires. Ideally, what we'll be able to have and share with the community will be applicable at a global and broader scale. The sheer water has been in the channel since dawn. Time to coil the cables and head back to port. It's still doing its thing. What you're seeing here is raw research. No conclusions, only hypotheses. The kicker, Bisson is still a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara, and she still has plenty of work to do before she can publish any results. But if she had any doubts about the importance of her research, all she has to do, she says, is look down. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. The very dry fall and winter and above average temperatures in California have created the perfect breeding ground for wildfires. Parts of the state are already drier than usual and officials are predicting a higher than normal fire risk for parts of the state this spring. Okay, Adrian, let's make a bit of a turn now. You have the story of a piano prodigy. I do, it's amazing and it's hard to believe, Rosie, that she is only 13. <laughs> So this is Alma Deutscher. She's, uh, this was about a year ago. The British girl could read music before she read words. She composed her first piano sonata at the age of six. And then of course came the violin, so young and already so famous. This daughter of two PhDs is no stranger to international acclaim. Now, Little Miss Mozart, as she has been called, made her Canadian debut this weekend. Salima Shivji dropped in on a rehearsal. Alma Deutscher may be only 13 years old, but she's already done more than most classical musicians can dream of. Mastering the piano and the violin, which she started playing when she was barely out of diapers and composing countless pieces, including this full-length opera of Cinderella, when she was 10, before most kids have even heard of opera. When I was four, I had these melodies in my head, um, which I would play on the piano. I didn't know how to write them down. I didn't know it was called composing. Um, I just had these ideas in my head. They're out of her head now and being performed all over the world. At rehearsals for her first performance in Canada, she's fully in control. 
little bit early. Coaching the singers, telling them exactly what to do. But the singers, who are more than twice her age, don't mind. Yes, is that okay? Okay, great. Age doesn't even seem to be a factor in this whole process. She is an incredible musician, an incredible artist. I've been singing longer than she's been alive, but the advice and the coaching that she gives us is actually so smart. That easy acceptance wasn't always the case when she was younger, meeting fellow musicians for the first time. And they would think, oh, well, who is this little girl? And what are we doing with her? And then when we started to play together and they actually had the piece, then they began to take me seriously. She doesn't care much for pop music or rap. She's hoping she can sway other young people to listen to her kind of music. Some children think that classical music is boring and old and it's and it's for old people, but you know, um, I think it, if they find out that it's not only written by old dead men with beards, but it's actually also written by a 13 year old girl. Now comes the hard part for Alma. She says she only has time for one instrument and will have to pick her favorite. But one thing's for certain I know I'll always be a composer because I can't live not being a composer. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Toronto. Hey, you should subscribe to our newsletter. We take a deep dive into the day's most important stories, look ahead uh, at what's on the radar for the show. The National Today delivered to your inbox Monday through Friday. The world wars, Korea, Vietnam, wars far removed from Canada's first peoples, White man's battles, some said, on battlefields in foreign lands. But the wars reached into Indian, Inuit and Métis homes across the country. Aboriginal men and women volunteered in the thousands. Many sacrificed their Indian status to do so. Many sacrificed their lives. Over 6,000 Aboriginal people joined the armed forces during World War II. For many, the threat of Nazism expanding to this country seemed very, very real. But even while they were fighting fascism on the front lines, Aboriginal soldiers were fighting racism at home. Harry and Teresa both grew up in the prairies, both in Métis settlements on the fringes of white society. The Métis knew about battles. Their enemies were poverty, tuberculosis, and indifference. We get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to bed at uh, whenever the sun goes down. Just to make a living, just to put food on the table, there was no, no, no money involved. There was nothing. There was no. There was nothing there for us. I come home crying once. I told my mother, and and uh, she says, "What's the matter with you?" You know, and uh, I says, "Well, they beat me up outside. They they after me." And she says, "What for?" I says, "Well, they call me dirty, stinking Indian." And he says, "Go on away. You know, you tell them kids over there that you're." great-grandfather was pure white, you know. While Canada ignored Aboriginal calls for help, the Aboriginal people answered Canada's. Some were thirsty for adventure. Some felt a duty to defend the Queen who had signed their treaties. Others wanted three square meals a day. Our uh, whole community enlisted. All the guys were gone. And there was not very many young people left. And the older guys went too. I mean, the married people went. I mean, our community was devastated. My father says, well, he says, you're a man. You're a soldier. You're fighting for your country. And that's the words that he said. And he dug in his pocket and pulled out 52 cents and put it on the table. He says, now go and get a bottle of Cataba wine. <laughs> For 18-year-old Harry, whose father Joseph was a World War I vet, the war brought the first taste of alcohol and the first taste of equality. This is the first time in my life I had any clothes that I could talk about. So, and I, they give me boots, and they give me soap, and they give me a towel, and all them things that, uh, that help us every day. 
Teresa's brother, George Dion, enlisted immediately. When Teresa signed up, 18 years old, she didn't want anyone to know she was Métis. If you um, told anybody you were Métis that you weren't accepted into their circle, and we always strive to be accepted, of course. Teresa served in the Women's Corps, posted in Alberta. Harry went overseas, spent two years in England. So here are some of the stories we're following this week on the national trade and North Korea will be some of the key topics when Donald Trump hosts Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Last week, the U.S. president signaled he's interested in rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Japan is the biggest economic player in that trade deal. Trump is also looking for some advice on how to approach the upcoming summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. I have some, some regrets about the way that I have represented what the company does. That is former Cambridge Analytica CEO Alexander Nix. He is being hauled in front of a British House of Commons inquiry to explain inconsistencies in the evidence he gave in February. Nix told MPs then that his firm doesn't use Facebook data to target voters, even though undercover video has surfaced of Nix bragging about helping Donald Trump win the presidential election. Facebook also says Cambridge Analytica improperly obtained the personal information of 87 million users. Can you hear us? Pop, pop, we're screaming, we're crying. And high school students across the United States are getting ready to walk out of school again on Friday. The planned protest coincides with the 19th anniversary of the Columbine shooting. Young people are pressuring lawmakers to put an end to gun violence. Last month, students walked out of their schools for 17 minutes to remember the 17 people killed in February's Parkland, Florida school shooting. There has been a cross-country, even international outpouring of support for the Humboldt Broncos in the week since the crash. We've shown you tributes from artists, actors, regular people, regular Canadians. Last night, one more. Drake was in his usual spot for game one of the Raptors' first playoff series, wearing a number 14 white, green, and gold Humboldt Broncos jersey. And that alone sparked plenty of grateful comments online. But it was more than just repping the Broncos courtside. What happened in the locker room after the game is our moment of the day. Raptors win at 114, 106. Good job, good start. All right, start of a journey. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, sorry, sorry, guys. If I can ask one favor, you guys. I don't know if you guys know know this story, but you know, um, these kids, unfortunately, um, a lot of families suffer from this from this bus crash. So if we get all the signs. So as you can see, he dropped by the locker room. He got all the members of the number one team in the East to sign it. The Raptors tweeted the video, dedicating it to the 16 victims of the crash and the, quote, 13 battling. We don't know what they're going to do with the jersey yet, but, uh, you know, Drake's got 41 million followers on Instagram where he posted this. So lots of people will be uh, reaching out and, and watching to see how that unfolds. And, you know, it's, it's, it is amazing, uh, the outpouring of support. Again, a as it should be, but if anyone has been wondering, you know, is it making a difference? There was that really poignant tweet uh, earlier this week from the Humboldt Broncos on the day that everyone in Canada seemed to be wearing their jerseys in support. And it simply said, we see you, we hear you, and we love you. So uh, an indication that, that all this love really is being felt. That is a national for Sunday, April the 15th. Good night. Good night.